So a little bit moving from sound communication to the idea of, an, of how uh, groups of, um, of swarms of birds uh, ab are able to, I guess, communicate somehow uh, to perform fairly complex algorithms. So Bernard, go for it. Okay, can you hear me all? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, well, first I want to thank Shafi, Michael, and David uh, for inviting me to this workshop. Uh, I mean, I knew I would be in for a treat, but it's, uh, I have to say it's been fantastic. Uh, the talks have been just wonderful. I've learned a lot of stuff. So I want to thank you, thank you all for that. I'm not so sure you'll be thanking me just as, just as much at the end of my talk uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, the, the unclear relevance uh, to the topic at hand of what uh, I'm going to say. But I hope that you will, you will find some, something of, of interest um, along the way. Uh, that is not my real concern. I have one real concern, uh, which is your stomach, because you have you have not had food uh, since breakfast until I mean unless you took a break uh, somewhere. So it means that you're all in a very bad mood. So if you have a nasty question to me, don't worry. I will interpret it as your stomach speaking. So what am I going to talk about here? Um, I, I'm a computer scientist, so I have to start with the Turing machine. Uh, Alan Turing defined uh, the concept of universal computation uh, and started the field of computer science. Uh, what's remarkable about his construction of Turing machine, which I'm sure you've seen before, and I don't have to go uh, over this, is how lame it is. In fact, in Alan Turing's uh, worldview, there are two things. There's information, that's what's on the tape. Uh, and, and then that information gets processed. There's a processing. So there's this sort of binary thing. Uh, and it never asks the question, but, but, but how do we get the information to be processed? How's the communication between all this? It just simply pumps. And that's a stroke of genius because uh, that's how the field had to be started out by ignoring communication. Now, once we started having some kind of a theory about what was going on, uh, then, uh, starting in the 50s, I would say, with information theory, uh, but then later on uh, with uh, the emergence of networks uh, and things like cryptography, uh, the, the concept of communication become increasingly important. Now, if you're a software, uh, I mean, if you're a computer uh, engineer, the, the, this is really the issue of architecture. I mean, obviously a Turing, no computer looks like this Turing machine. Uh, except in some abstract fashion. A computer is a very complicated beast, unlike that machine. And it's complicated because it has to deal with communication mostly. Now, there also emerged a branch of theoretical computer science called uh, communication complexity, uh, which took this very original uh, angle, in my view, which is to actually go inside the processing element and say, you know what, if you really want to understand processing, uh, then you have to start thinking about communication, that, that processing can be cut apart, can be dissolved into processes of communication. Uh, it's hard to explain how brilliant this concept has turned out to be. Um, so it's really a triad. There, there are three things going on here, uh, information processing and communication. That's really what computer uh, computing is all about. Um, now, in the world of biology, th there are some similarities. Uh, so just to pick an example that you've never heard of, uh, it's some kind of strange virus uh, of very little importance. Uh, what could happen is that this virus gets into your, so let me tell you a little story uh, from a sort of biological uh, language. So the, uh, these uh, viruses get through your nose or through your mouth, and then they go into your lungs, through the lining of your lungs, the epithelial cells. And then magically, uh, they get inside the cell. Now, the way they do this is because they, they have the spike proteins, this little, which gives it the name cor uh, coronavirus. And, they, and then they bind to these uh, enzymes, these receptors called ACE2. Uh, and uh, once, it's, once the binding takes place, then the magic of chemistry uh, pulls this thing down through the membrane inside the cell. Now, a quick point, which is important, uh, why do we have ACE2? What does this thing do? This, this thing is in the lungs, but it's everywhere pretty much, uh, which is why the COVID-19 can be such a nasty disease. It's because ACE2 regulate, help regulates blood pressure. 
Now, blood is a communication process. Blood is mostly used to transport things, uh, uh, your immune system, your, your oxygen, you know, things like that. Uh, so it's all about communication. Now, ACE2 makes that communication possible. And unwillingly, I guess, it, it, it allows the virus to get inside the cell. And then, uh, you, you know, then typically you would look at the biochemistry. You would say, okay, look, this virus has a membrane. So all the good stuff that's inside has to come out. And so for this, we have to kill the membrane. Okay, we're gonna lyse it. That's lysosome, that's gonna, uh, gonna do that. Okay, then we are in the cytoplasm. We're not in the nucleus right now. So this virus, what is it gonna do? Now, if it was a normal virus, if we try to get into the nucleus, but it's not gonna do that. Uh, it don't even try to get into the nucleus. And so what it will do is, is find magically some ribosomes out there and start uh, express and it starts translating, uh, producing some proteins. Now this is very interesting. The proteins that it reproduces, it has lots of choice because it's a big genome, but it produces polymerase. That's the protein that's used to for do for doing replication. Now this is strange because viruses typically go inside the nucleus and they hijack the replicating uh, the replication system, but that, but not coronavirus. Coronavirus is gonna replicate itself by using its own technology. It only uses the uh, ribosome. Okay, fair, fine. Then it, uh, it makes tons of replications uh, and it now it, it can start expressing all these proteins to make the membrane, to, to transform, to make a new viruses. To do that, and I, I don't have a picture of the cytoplasm, it's, is what's you know outside the nucleus in uh, uh, in eukaryote cells, and it's a bit complicated. It's got all these organelles and stuff like that. But the point is that this virus, these virus, all these uh, the the genomes, the parts of the genome, are going to be traveling f first through something called the ER. You you don't have to know what it is, and then magically it's going to go uh, into the Golgi apparatus where it's going to form the membrane. And then finally, it's going to hit against the wall, against the membrane of the cell, and, is, and it wants to get out. And so there is uh, exocytosis, which will take place. Again, the magic of chemistry uh, can explain this entire pathway. And this is extremely complex. And many Nobel Prizes have gone into elucidating every each step. Now, that's the traditional way of looking at biology. But there's a dual version, which is to say, no, no, the biochemistry is not the interesting part. The interesting part is the choreography. How in the world do you get all this, this dance to take place uh, billions of times in a very reliable fashion? Yeah, I should add one more thing. The, the coronavirus is very long. In fact, it breaks these, the famous upper bound on viral length. Uh, it's so long that it produces tons of errors when it hits the ribosome and it replicates itself. It makes tons of errors. And so it has to fix this error. So it has an error correcting code uh, mechanism, a proofreading mechanism that it builds itself, that it has its own proteins to do that. It's quite uh, remarkable. Um, now, it's a subtle difference to say, you know, let's not just look at, at a bunch of biochemical steps and study very, very carefully all the equations that explains those, these chemical reactions, this sort of, you know, tr uh, tr traditional way. I would argue that the big mystery is not there. The big mystery is How's the whole thing happening to begin with? How does it know how to find the ACE2? How does it know to find the ribosomes? How does it know to find all these other stuff that it needs to find? Uh, as a cell is a very packed, crowded stuff with all kinds of irrelevant material for the purposes of this virus. How in the world does it communicate to be at the right time, at the right place to do the right thing? That is a complete mystery. Whereas in biochemistry, at least we know a lot of stuff or at least biochemists know a lot of stuff. I should not include myself in that list. Uh, but the communication is the big mystery. So in that sense, it's very similar. It's, it's very similar to computer science where, where it took a long time to realize that the hard part really is communication, not processing. Um, okay, all right, a bird, I love birds. So this big little guy, handsome little fellow is called a starling. And it's a remarkable bird. It's like it likes to fly uh, in big flocks. Now, this is a movie you may have seen before, uh, and it's, it's just one minute, so it won't take too long. And I can't resist uh, showing it because it's it's so spooky. Now, you look at this, and you can ask. So these are starlings. These are the birds that I just showed, and you can ask, well, how many are there? Well, nobody knows for sure, but 
probably this one is more than 1 million. Uh, sometimes up to 5 million have been spotted. Um, they never seem to collide, which means that the birthday paradox is obviously false, uh, or at least these birds have never heard of it. Uh, and then they form this amazing thing. And now, if you all are um, very nosy, it's, um, it's, um, you see the movie Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. It's pretty scary. It, it resembles it. Um, this. Anyway, now you can ask tons of questions and we don't know the answer. Like, why do they do this? Well, there are speculations, but nobody knows for sure. Anyway, they do this and then they go to bed or they, you know, they lose. Um, and so, about. Um, Okay, we're almost done. Now, this is a big flock, but this is not the biggest, okay? You have to understand that they are birds, or at least they used to be birds, passenger pigeons, in, in the United States, that would flock um, in the billions, not the millions, in the billions with a B. Uh, the flocks were so big that it would take two weeks. If you happen to be flying over where you live, which would be very unfortunate, for you for, for two weeks, you would have these birds flying over your thing. Um, why do they do this? Now, so I watched movies like this about 15 years ago at Princeton and this, this guy, Ian Cousin, who's one of the big experts on birds, uh, was talking about this and he never mentioned the word algorithms, but he was really talking about algorithms. So I just became fascinated and said, well, wait a minute, I, we need to understand uh, what's going on. And the good thing when you know nothing about a topic is that you think, that uh, how hard can it be, okay? <laughs> and then, and then of course, and the more you know, the more you realize that this is, this is hopelessly difficult, uh, this thing. Um, and you also realize you're hardly the first person to, to make this, this point and to work on it. Um, now there are three classes, families of approaches to this problem. Uh, one called physics, uh, another is a sort of multi-aging based system. And the other I will not talk about, which is more recent, which is active matter. Uh, so let me talk about the first two. Um, now, this is a, a throwaway comment, our bird's bird brain, but it's actually really fundamental uh, to this thing because, um, I mean, to some extent, my, <laughs> my big sort of existential crisis ha ha has, is contained in this question. Uh, which is that the natural approach to say flocking, okay, is a sort of Occam's razor uh, idea where you are going to try to find, so they have brains and brains, birds have brains and they have complicated brains and, and brains are behind all of that. But you will assume that the brain is as inactive as possible or rather that it does the minimalistic thing. So maybe the, the brain can follow two rules, three rules, four rules, and that's it. You, you're gonna assume that and that could be completely wrong. In fact, I have great doubts about that. I don't understand any, there's no principle I know of that says that when you try to do something very simple to go from A to B, you will try to minimize the utilization and the sophistication of your brain. I mean, it could be just completely wrong, okay? So, however, that is the basis of most work on bird flocking, which could also means that it's totally doomed. But that's a topic if I have time, I'll get back to. I still believe it's the right approach because uh, the brain, and this is not at all a, a jab at neuroscience or anything, but the brain is incredibly complicated. And so if you can do something without actually pretending that there's a brain uh, and you happen to be right, this would be wonderful. But if you actually need to explain something, if you need the full power of the brain, this becomes extremely difficult, okay? So let's see what we can do if we assume that birds are indeed bird brain, which is the brain is almost irrelevant. So statistical mechanics, uh, like much uh, complex uh, systems already in, 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 uh, in physics come from statistical mechanics, in particular, uh, the IC model. Uh, so what you have is a, is a set of uh, particles 
Uh, and there are basically two forces that act on them. I don't use the word force in a technical sense. I just mean it's a metaphor. These particles want to do two things. So in the simplest case, the so-called ferromagnetic case, the particles want to be similar to their neighbors. They want to be some mimetic, you know, mimetic thing. They just want to do what their neighbors do. They want to do the same. On the other hand, there is a lot of stochasticity. There's lots of um, uh, thermal uh, energy in the system. So they also fluctuate a lot. They, you know, depending on how much temperature there is, this, you know, they cannot keep up with this sort of army-like uh, discipline. Is the tension between order and disorder, which comes from this, the minimize the, the you try to minimize the energy, that's order, and you want to maximize the entropy, and that's uh, disorder. And is this conflict between these two forces, if you will, that's the basis of statistical mechanics. And it, it's a field that has been extremely successful, I mean, one has to admit, and has wonderful ideas. Uh, it's also possi possible to look at the entire field as a branch of probability theory. There's remarkably little physics in it, actually. Um, that, so you have, say, n uh, particles, and they have spin. So let's say the, the spin is up or down, uh, as the pictures uh, represent. So there are two to the n possibilities, and each one has an energy associated with it. We'll see what we do with that. So there are two to the n numbers. Uh, so n is very big, typically. N could be Avog Avogadro's number. So this is a gigantic set, OK? And now what you want is find the probability of being in a particular configuration. What is the probability I'm going to be in this energy, that energy, and that sort of thing? So you have these unknown, these variables, p1 through p2 to the n, and you want to find what they are. And so, well, there are many possibilities, obviously. So your, your goal is to say, well, there's one constraint uh, which is there's a minimum, there's a mean energy, the, there's an average energy which is set by the system. You, you can set it. Uh, now, this is important to understand that the, the energy of the system is not fixed. What's fixed is the average. It's, it's because this is not a closed system. This uh, system communicates with the outside, like the, there could be a, a bath outside, the, you know, the, there could be air, there could be. A, so, so there are molecules bouncing back and forth. And so there's transfer of energy in and out. So you don't know the energy uh, is not specified. What's specified is the mean over a certain period of time. All right, so, so that's why it gives you, this is an interesting problem. It's not uh, trivial. And if you do the math, it's very simple math. And you find that there's only one solution. It's the Boltzmann distribution. And this gives you the probability of each uh, configuration and uh, T is a parameter that emerges from this optimization problem. It's a Lagrange multiplier. And Z is simply there so that these numbers sum up to one. And Z is called the partition function. Well, what's important to understand about the partition function is that as a sum, it's a gigantic thing because there are lots of these numbers, tons of them. So it's typically impossible to compute this anymore. Okay, and so, all right. So um, now, in the case of the icing model, what I just told you is a very general thing. But, but now in the icing model, which has been studied a lot, and, and to take the, the simplest case, the thermomagnetic case, um, then we consider that we have this grid, say, in two dimensions. Uh, and the particles sit at these nodes uh, on the grid. Okay, I think it's a large grid, so don't worry too much on the boundaries, what happens at the boundaries. It doesn't much matter. Um, and so, so, so you have uh, these uh, uh, spins that go up and down. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, so, um, do, 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 do. so now you have to define the energy. Um, so the energy is defined by the Hamiltonian, uh, which is a function of these uh, spins. Of these, of, so typically it's plus one, minus one, plus one if, if it points up, and minus one if it points down. And um, so this sum, just to make sure we uh, understand uh, how this works, I'm, I'm going to sum over all the nodes, i. So these are all these guys, all, all the particles. I'm just sum over this. For each particle i, there's a set of neighbors. OK, uh, in this case, uh, you have you know, eight, uh, you have eight neighbors, uh, 62 r. So, so you sum over the neighbors, OK? And then you take the, um, the product of the spins, all right? So, uh, typically, you want the energy to be very low. And therefore, since there's a minus and J is a copying constant that's positive in this case. So, so you want this guy to be as big as possible. And so you want these guys to have the same sign. So you want them to be all plus one or all minus one. 
but they cannot be all plus one or all minus one because uh, because you have these constraints over the average uh, uh, energy, Hamiltonian, uh, if you will. So anyway, you plug in your Boltzmann distribution and you find this formula, okay, which follows uh, directly. And again, I mean, the point is that these are, each element is very simple here, but because there's so many of them, the whole thing is very complicated, okay? Now, there are many questions you, you can ask about this, but in the context of this workshop, there's only, really only one that, that matters. Can you use this system to transmit uh, information? So let's say that you are here and you perturb these, uh, these or maybe four of them or something. You have a little perturbation on this particle. All right. So maybe you wait until it's, it's at equilibrium. The system is equilibrated. So there's the stationary distribution. Yeah, the, the Boltzmann distribution is the stationary distribution. So these systems are all at equilibrium. I mean, the, the entire field assumes equilibrium. So anyway, you perturb this guy, say it's minus one and you turn it to plus one. And you want to know whether uh, this, this perturbation will be echoed, say on the other side. Like, will this guy over here, or just a question, do you see my arrow? I'm, I'm yeah. sure, yeah, you see, okay, good, thanks. Um, Bernard, can I just ask you a quick question? Yeah. Yeah, should, of course. I be, should I keep in my mind an analogy of this system to these birds where each, uh, that a, a bird is on a vertex here or? Yeah, or? Yeah. So I'm gonna get to this in, okay. Okay. in 10 seconds, yes. So you want to know whether information can go from here to there. And the theory pretty much answers that uh, question. It, it tells you in general, the answer is no. Uh, now think of this term, when the temperature uh, is very low, Okay, so uh, it will say it's very high. So uh, it's, uh, it's very high. There, there, there are tons of thermal fluctuations because sort of entropy takes over. And so these probabilities are about the same. It's, it's about the uniform distribution, uh, basically. So, so everything is independent, basically. So if you perturb this, this has no effect on anybody else because they all have their own independent life. Okay, so when the temperature is very high, the answer is no. And when the temperature is very low, then the answer is no. Because when the temperature is very low, then basically this is gonna, this exponential is gonna act as a screen, as a mask to pick out the, the lowest energy. It's actually gonna drive the system to the lowest possible energy. There's gonna be one solution. And, and that's where the system is gonna be. So this is like a solid, it's like a crystal, if you will. So, if you take a solid uh, crystal and you simply a piece of sugar and you simply perturb one tiny grain, it has no effect uh, on the rest. So when T is big or when T is very small, the answer is no. This system cannot transmit information. However, there is a magical, uh, there's a magical temperature called critical temperature where uh, the, at that temperature, there is long range correlations. So you can actually use that to transmit information. And this is gonna be the connection to flocking. Uh, the key thing is it's a magical number. It, it has to be fine tuned very, very carefully, okay? Because uh, if you just try random temperature, it's never gonna happen. But you have to magically, so that's how phase transitions occur. Phase transition here will, uh, will be second order of the uh, uh, phase, uh, phase transitions. And so uh, it will be a very tiny, tiny, tiny uh, range of temperatures. All right, now the birds. We're gonna use the same idea to understand birds. Now, the starting point of this work, um, well, one of the big, big starting points of work was a heroic uh, effort by um, a group of people in Rome, Italy. Uh, now, this is not one paper with all these people. I uh, compile uh, most of the authors who've worked on part or the, of this work over five years. It's an enormous amount of effort that these people did um, to, to try to have this analogy with the IC model. Now, the thing is birds are hard. Uh, I appreciated this by talking to people who actually uh, work with uh, experiments, which would not be me. Um, you know, fish are easier, uh, dogs are easier uh, simply because, you know, you cannot tell birds to do what you want them to do. So you simply wait and then birds do something and you take a video. 
and then you just simply analyze the video. You cannot say, okay, we're gonna try like 50 takes and see what happens. Well, maybe you can do it over 50 different days, but there's very little control that you can do with birds. So birds are, I mean, I know some of the animals we heard, whales and elephants, I'm sure must be extremely difficult to handle for similar reasons. But I think birds is the ultimate. You, you can't even touch them. You cannot, so you're totally passive observer here. So anyway, so it, they took these videos that you don't have a million here. You have like 2000 or something like that. And then they do the, they did the computer vision work, which means that you do the registration and all of that uh, to find the velocity of these birds and so on. And you, since you, you pretend this is in equilibrium, uh, I mean, it's a big uh, ask uh, to think of this in equilibrium, but it's not completely stupid because the velocities are roughly the same speed. So, so you can really look at the transversal, uh, the heading as being the spin, uh, if you will, and that you can more or less think of it as being in equilibrium. So you're gonna replicate what we did before, but instead of plus one minus one, what you're gonna do is take the heading. So for each bird, you take the velocity divided by its length. So this is just, the, you know, so this is in three dimensions. So this is a point on the unit, uh, on the unit sphere, uh, and uh, it's a two-dimensional object. And so this is a vector. So you take the uh, dot product, and then that's it. This is going to give you the probability. So this is a well-known model. It's called the Heisenberg uh, model in statistical physics. Uh, and uh, so this is your uh, equivalent. Now you can do some some. Uh, some first principle, if you will, um, uh, Newtonian uh, analysis of this, and you derive this large one dynamics. So it, it's just a differential equation with a with a stochastic term here that's uh, that's just white noise uh, that, uh, that you had uh, some stochasticity, which is essential for uh, this entire approach. Um, and then what you want to study is many things, but in particular the correlation function. So here's what you do: you take a bird i. And you look at all its neighbors at distance r, or maybe between distance r and distance r plus one meter or something like that. So a tiny little you know, uh, ring, um, and you call this n sub i. So you take the average uh, uh, dot product with bird i of these other velocities, uh, I mean headings, and then you, you just take the average, and that's your uh, correlation. So, it, it, it could be zero, it could be negative, it could be positive, and it, well, it tells you the correlation between these birds, but it tells you the correlation at a certain distance because R can be anything you want. So you do this empirical work, again, again, I really have to praise the enormous amount of work this represented, and I have to give these people an enormous amount of credit. Um, anyway, they, they, they plot this curve, which makes physicists very happy because uh, this is sort of thing that they love to see. Uh, in particular, they want to know when the correlation is zero uh, and the correlation is zero. In other words, from here to here is when you can have communication because there's correlation. So if you perturb something, there's gonna be some echo somewhere uh, down up to 10 meters. After 10 meters, uh, it's gonna be lost, okay? Or some negative correlation, but by and large, it's gonna be lost. And so uh, now if you replicate these experiments, uh, but with different number of, of birds or different distances, then you find that this is a linear term. In other words, this is a fixed constant as a uh, factor of 40. So that means that there is no scale, okay? Because you, you could call this number here, which must be like 12, to be uh, the scale. Now, if you found 12 every time, regardless of the number of birds, you always find 12, then that would be the scale of the system. But, but what you find is it's proportional to the number of birds. In other words, there's no scale. It's a scale-free system, which is what you need to have. It's a, it's, it's a necessary, not sufficient, but necessary condition for criticality. And so at least it tells you this is scale-free and this uh, makes sense if you think of uh, communication. However, in, a in this particular case, there are two possible interpretations and I'm not sure the jury is completely out on that. Um, one is to say there's criticality, just like the, the IC model. Now there's a, there's a problem with that interpretation because remember in the IC model, there's a magic temperature. So how in the world do these birds manage to have some magic average energy that they have in order for this to happen? This would be unexplained. You would have to explain how they engineer this because this, 
when we say temperature, now it's not the temperature of the, of the air. It's, it's temperature is in relation to the energy that they expand. Um, so that's an explanation that's, that's a little bit uh, suspicious. Although like sand pile is, these are systems which have criticality, uh, self-organized criticality that do not require fine tuning. So there are examples outside the Ising model where you do have criticality without uh, fine tuning. But anyway, it's a little bit dubious, who knows? But there's something that's more likely, which is known as the Goldstone mode. And that's something that comes from quantum mechanics and stuff, which says that when you, when you don't have plus one, minus one, but you have a continuous uh, spin. So, so you see, the spin is, is a vector uh, of, uh, in three dimensions of length one. So you need vector. So it has all these symmetries, obvious symmetries. So the system has continuous symmetries and therefore there's, there's gonna be symmetry breaking. You know, the, the birds decide to fly in this direction and not that direction. There's nothing magical about the direction they happen to be flying. It's just a breaking of symmetry. And there's all these symmetries. It could go into another thing. And the point is that it requires no energy to change uh, the, this uh, common direction of what's a bird, say a leader, decides to change. So anyway, I don't want to say more about this. There's a continued debate uh, about this, but it, it's a good example where uh, with this kind of um, metaphor uh, coming from, from statistical mechanics, you build this completely phenomenological uh, system or not completely, but almost uh, with a little bit of first, um, first uh, principle. Uh, and then you somehow makes you speculate, but I think soundly speculate about the possibility what birds have to do to have communication across the flock. So when, because sometimes a bird says, now we're going left and they all follow. How is that happening? Are you, because it's not true that it's the leader. It is not true that it's the bird that just happens to be flying ahead of everybody who calls the shots. That, that simply is not true experimentally. It's, we see that. And there is no broadcasting mechanism from the outside world. So it's a very interesting scientific question and, and these are possible answers, um, uh, who knows? However, this runs into problems when you push this, uh, uh, this work. This Hamiltonian is a quadratic function and this is why you can show from this that the information propagates through diffusion. Now, if you remember you know, your, your, your chemistry uh, classes, diffusion moves at a speed that um, that goes down to zero is one over square root of t. So you know the, the it moves not linearly in time t, but a, as the square root. So the the larger the system, the slower the diffusion goes. This contradicts experiments. So they did these experiments where at some point they observe the birds and they make a, the birds make a very sharp turn and they want to know why. Uh, you know what's happening. So um, so they again the, did all these experiments, uh, and these are a picture of the turn of all these birds. The z direction is interesting. They, they do the sharp turn almost in a plane, okay? But it's a very, very sharp turn. And then they measure the polarization, which is the, the average, uh, the, uh, the length of the average heading, okay? So, <clears throat> so the, if this were random, this, would be, this is like the first Fourier coefficient. If this was random, this would be almost zero. Uh, and there'd be no polarization. But if the bird decide to, to work in the same direction, to be united, uh, they need, they're very polarized. And um, I, I guess maybe the term is not the right one. But anyway, um, oh, what did I do here? Sorry, oh yeah. Um, so what they found is that there's almost a linear fit. Now, <laughs> if you're a statistician listening to this, you might have some serious eye rolling going on here. Uh, Okay, maybe these two guys are outliers, who knows? But anyway, it, it kind of fits a line uh, so with square root of one over one minus three. So what you find is that <clears throat> the speed is inversely proportional to square root of one minus three. So the greater the polarization, the greater the speed, which kind of makes sense when, when, when those guys uh, decide to to, to be very, very united to be, uh, in one direction, then the communication is gonna be super fast. Um, so anyway, these means that the previous model doesn't work. There's no, the previous Hamiltonian will not, will simply not give you these results. So when the birds decide to turn, something else is happening. These are the limits of the statistical mechanics approach. Anyway, this is an interesting 
uh, development over several years and based on real data. Uh, now I've looked at this, uh, I guess more like a computer scientist mind, uh, might, which is as a multi-agent system. So now a bird is just an agent and they, uh, they look at the neighbors and there's some rules that tells you which uh, bird can influence. Now this was true in a previous example uh, as well. Maybe I, you know, well, there's no point going back, but one assumes that the bird can only see like five or six or seven birds that are neighbors. If they cannot see the entire thing, okay? So these graphs are never complete. In fact, these graphs are almost always very sparse, okay? They're connected, but they're sparse. Uh, so there are certain communication rules which tells you how you exchange information. And once you've exchanged information, then each agent lives in a certain state and there's some transition rules that tells you how the state changes. But the point is that the graph changes. This is very important that not only the communication changes, but the topology changes. I mean, the birds are flying, the flocks are just constantly being rearranged. Okay, so um, now this concept really is ancient in physics. Let me show you this little thing. So you have three metronomes and they are placed on a piece of wood on two cans of Coke. Uh, doesn't matter if it's Pepsi, I think. And uh, so anyway, they talk to each other because this board, this wooden board actually communicates uh, the oscillations of these um, metronomes. And eventually they will, they will synchronize automatically. Okay, there's, so it's a very simple graph and there's a pro process of, of uh, synchronization. Uh, <clears throat> this has been known for hundreds of years. And, uh, and it's pretty much good theory to explain exactly what's going on. In fact, there's this famous uh, concerto for metronome by Ligeti, you know, famous composer, modern composer. And it's based on the first principle of uh, music. And um, yeah. Okay, I think it's. I think it's pretty much all you can take out of it, but it's it's very beautiful. It's supposed to be very beautiful. Uh, anyway, um, here's another example that I love, which is a fireflies. That um, if you look at, so this is a real picture of real fireflies, a video. <clears throat> so what happens is fireflies have this mating dance, and and they reach uh, the flash in synchrony. Uh, now this is very interesting because. Again, this can extend over several miles with no line of sight. So uh, Sir Francis Drake uh, observed that in uh, Thailand um, many years ago. And he, 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 he thought he was having hallucinations uh, because these fireflies covered miles and miles and they turned around the river so they couldn't see each other and they, and, and they're, and, and they flashed completely in synchrony. How, how is that possible? And uh, so, so he thought he was just going. Now, now he, he had, a, I understand he was a heavy drinker. And so he reported this to England, this phenomenon. But he said, maybe I'm just hallucinating. And that's what they believed, uh, unfortunately. So his wonderful scientific discovery was put in, in, in a drawer and rediscovered hundreds of years later in Europe. Needless to say, the people in Thailand and in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia had known this <laughs> forever. So for them, there's nothing, but for Europeans, this was a discovery um, and um, calling for explanation. Now, just keep in mind how the communication works here. These are not stadium waves, like when you see in stadiums where they have these waves. These are more like circadian cycles. Uh, these, these are cycles that are synchronized. So when they're synchronized, if you think of communication, it's, it's, in, it's infinite, the speed is infinite, okay? This is, they're, they're actually completely synced. Okay, and um, so it's a completely different process from say a diffusion process or even a ballistic process. Uh, so these, there are models that, that can explain this uh, pretty well. And now here's the thing is that you have these rules, uh, Reynolds rules uh, that this is sort of the inventor of virtual, of the field of virtual reality. And in, in the sixties, I believe he said, well, I think the way to understand bird flocking is Birds should never be too close. They should align with the neighbors. They should fly toward neighbors and they should avoid occlusion. So let's build a model 
that has these four rules and see what happens. There is no theory of any kind, it's just playing with this. But then what happened is miraculous because now this is not a movie from the 60s, this is a recent movie, <laughs> but this is an, an entirely a simulation, okay? And, and the thing is that it almost passes the Turing test for humans. In other words, if you show an actual flux and, <clears throat> and these bogus flux, and you ask somebody to distinguish which is fake and which is real. This is very difficult to do, and, and which is why Hollywood uses these rules. Uh, it has become uh, gospel. Now, here's something really interesting that goes back to one of the questions about the elephants uh, that uh, Joyce was uh, talking about. Because we failed the Turing test, and we cannot distinguish be between real flocks and fake flocks, that, that, does it mean we're doing a good job? I mean, it could be that if birds could watch that, they would be laughing. They would say, oh, come on, this is not flocks. You're, you're being silly. Maybe because we humans are not evolved to be good at picking out fake flocks from real flocks. So this is a, I, I think this is a deep question about, about science in general. When, when we think we're doing a good job modeling, what do we mean by that? Are we just pleasing ourselves? So the movies look good. Yeah, but is that really the measure? Um, now, if you want to do some theory, this is extremely difficult. Um, I mean, and, and so what people do is they get rid of three of the rules and they keep only one, aligned with neighbors. And so this is first Vishak and then Cocker Smale rule. So actually this was done at uh, Berkeley, I believe. And um, um, so anyway, each bird has a radius of sight and at time t, it simply looks at its neighbors and just takes some kind of weighted average of the velocities and it just updates. It's a discrete time thing and it just keeps on doing this. So what I showed years ago, I mean, I got, that kind of got me started in this, in this uh, business and I really enjoyed it because uh, was there any way I showed that the, this graph always settles. Eventually it converges to a fixed graph. Uh, and uh, now, well, you don't have to go through this uh, math thing, but, but you have to uh, understand this feedback loop, which is that the network induces updates on the velocities. And once the velocities are updated, then the network changes. So there's this feedback loop that goes on forever that makes it interesting. And I mean, sometimes quite complicated from a complex systems point of view. Now, what I showed is that you have fragmentation. Uh, typically here's what happens, your birds are flying in, so semi-randomly, and then they decide to align themselves. So there's gonna be a period of time where they simply start merging into flocks. So a flock is defined as a connected component in this graph. So they start merging uh, and then eventually they reach uh, steady state. So, <clears throat> uh, so, so the, the timeline has really three, three phases, the fragmentations, then when they start merging, uh, they don't have to merge into one flock. I mean, at some point there's a number of flocks and that's it. And then it's a steady state. Now, I spent quite a bit of time in my youth doing geometry. And what really struck me about all the work on birds flying in three dimensions, they never mentioned geometry. I mean, statistical physicists, I think they hate geometry. So they try, they did everything they could to avoid geometry. So they say, okay, we have, velocities and positions in three dimensions. So these are six numbers. And now that's it, this is the last time we'll ever talk about geometry. Um, so anyway, I, I was pleased that actually this involved quite a bit of geometry. I'll show you one example. Um, so this is a bird flying and doing its thing. Any given bird at, at the beginning can do all kinds of zigzaggy thing. In fact, birds can collude to drive another bird crazy doing all kinds of figure eights and stuff like that. So you can look at this in four dimensions. So the birds live in three dimensions, but you add time as a space time uh, thing. And then you reverse time. So, so you say, well, you know, this velocity comes from an averaging of other birds that came before, and this came out of this being average over here. And then you can undo that. And it goes like this. So you have this sort of branching thing. It's not a tree necessarily. I mean, there's only n birds. So at some point it will, uh, converge back. But anyway, you, you have this exponential number of paths that contribute to, to, the, to, to the position and the heading, and uh, some are more important than others. And uh, 
But if you look at the, this lives in, in four dimensional space. So there's geometry in there. Right? And here's what you can show that there's, there's always almost a straight path, always. After a while, at the, at the beginning, there might be no straight path, but after a while, there's always a path that's almost straight. And from these, you, you can prove theorems like this, that there's a magical function delta of t, which means that at time t, if you find two birds that are at distance bigger than delta t, then you know they will never ever meet again, okay? Uh, regardless of the position, this is of the angle. Uh, this is beautiful. And, uh, and of course, you, you are gonna need this kind of statements. You, if you wanna show that the flux converge, that at some point, you have to be able to say, well, you birds are either gonna to come together or you will never come together, but <laughs> you're not gonna come back again and, and again. So this kind of statements is almost a necessity uh, to do that. Now, if, if you look at a flock when the graph is fixed, uh, which will happen at the end, but it might happen in the middle also, or even at the beginning, uh, then this is a couple oscillator. So it's a piece of, mechanics of physics that's well uh, understood. Uh, so now when that happens, information, uh, let's say one sees a predator and has to tell its friends, the, the, this communication will take place at diffusion speed, okay? So it's pretty slow. It's, it's, so it's square root of the number of birds. However, there's something interesting when they collide. When two things collide and they decide to merge, then in that instant of collision, then uh, diffusion of the, I mean, the communication becomes holistic. It, it becomes linear in T, not just square root. Uh, it just much, much faster. And you can explain this through the power spectrum of these coupled uh, oscillators when they come together. But uh, okay, but we don't need to uh, do this. Uh, the next step, which to me uh, strikes me as, uh, I mean, something I've paid a lot of attention in recent years. Uh, which also is borrowed from physics, the concept of renormalization, uh, which is a dimension reduction or whatever you want to call it. But when you have a complex system with many, many agents, you're going to have at some point to make summaries of it, to, to, to say, well, you know, if you really want to understand what's going on, uh, maybe you can reduce the number of birds here. So, so if, for example, you could say, well, you know, maybe all these, all, all these subgroups, they almost behave over a period of time as though they were just one big bird, like a super bird, which you might define as being not an existing bird, but, but it's a flock, but it behaves almost like, like a bird and it takes information from. So this gives you a mode of communication that is hierarchical. In other words, if you want to, to, to send information from here to here, you don't necessarily have to go through the long path of birds, but you can go up to these uh, super, uh, super birds uh, flocks. And, and do that. Now, this is a picture, this is a coincidence, but I love that picture uh, that um, it's, it's a flock of birds, but which looks like a bird itself. It's, uh, or maybe if you believe in miracles, maybe that's a miracle, but it, it could also be um, like the birthday paradox, just a coincidence, <laughs> a Ramsey theory kind of thing. Uh, let's see, how much time do I have left? Maybe I should just, I don't know if I should skip this or not. Um, I have like five minutes or? I think officially your time is till 1.45. So that's a eight minutes, but maybe you want to leave some question. Some yeah, time. yeah. So, you know, I, if you don't mind, maybe I'll just skip this and just, yeah, I'd rather just simply slow down a little bit and talk about what I think I'd like this thing to be going. Uh, and I think communication is a, is a fundamental, is a completely fundamental aspect of understanding complex system, biological uh, uh, systems. So, the, 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 you know, when people ask me, when mathematicians ask me, what's an algorithm? And I, I, I like to say uh, an algorithm is a, an equation with memory. Uh, memory is the key role, uh, which, you by and large do not have in mathematics or in physics. Um, if you want to know how the solar system works, you, you don't need to know what happened to the planets a million years ago. You simply need to know what happened in, in, in the last two seconds, where they are and how fast they go. That's all you need to know. And 
clearly that's not true in the living world. I mean, for one thing, DNA is this archive of history, but it's not just where it is. Uh, the memory uh, that's present through all these different forms in living systems um, is very complex, but, but it, it plays an absolutely key role in particular at all time scales. Now in physics, a big thing is when you have different time scales to be able to separate them. Uh, but in biology, that's really, it seems a lot of the, the magic comes from the fact that time scales are not separated. They're completely uh, embedded. And so, so you can ask questions, for example, I mentioned earlier circadian uh, rhythms, uh, which take 24 hours. Uh, but when you think about it, circadian rhythms are based on biochemical reactions, which take, you know, fractions of milliseconds. So you go from milliseconds to 24 hours a, in a very reliable fashion. And, and this is endogenous. So it is not true that the circadian rhythm is determined by the sun. I mean, the sun helps, certainly, but that's not the reason. Uh, if, they, if they lock you up in a cave for months, you will still have your circadian rhythm, although it'll be off by a little bit. So, so there's an extremely complex network of protein reactions that somehow, and again, the circadian rhythm is a good example. It has been studied a lot and got Nobel Prize and all that. And the biochemistry, I think, is reasonably well understood. But there's still this very big mystery of, now it's one thing to describe every step of the way. It's another thing to say, well, why is this thing actually working? Um, you know, like if you uh, design um, biology like Lego blocks and you give the rules and then somebody says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bring. I'm going to build a, a, tw a 24 hour uh, clock, uh, and people say oh, you're crazy. There's no way with these Lego blocks uh, you can do that. It collapse by the time you put this thing, and that's the right answer. But how come in biology actually we can produce these very very complex things that don't seem to collapse? There's no really explanation, and I think the choreography of information and particular of time is the key thing. Now in biology, time. Um, appears, in my view, as to be the most difficult uh, variable of them all. Uh, we're very good at, at understanding snapshots. Uh, we understand, um, even at the level of the cell, we understand what a cell is or does at any given time. Now there's great single molecule, single cell uh, biology, uh, microscopy and all of that, but still, we don't have the movies. We don't have uh, uh, this notion of time that has, that has to be inferred. So you can use recurrent networks and that sort of thing. But that really is a huge, huge bottleneck. And it's, and I don't believe it's, it's just because we don't have the measurements. I mean, we don't have the measurements, but I also believe it's because we, we just don't have the science for it. We don't, we're very uncomfortable with time. Okay, now there's a field in computer science called distributed, distributed computing, which is, which illustrates this notion very well because it's a field where you set up to do things that seems totally trivial, but like very, very simple. And then you say, okay, we're gonna do this and it's gonna be very simple. And they realize the, the, the very simple solutions are all bogus. And, and to prove they're bogus is very hard. And then to find things that actually work very often is extremely difficult. And it seems to be inherently difficult. Uh, and, but that, I mean, life is a giant distributed system. And so, I think part of the problem is we don't have a good theory of time. I mean, if time is synchronized, it's parallel, okay, that's fine. But when it's just done with you know, all these different time scales doing their own things and, and, and intermingling, then I think we don't have a theory for this. And since I've come from the world of theory, it could very well be that much of what I'm saying is somewhat um, or completely ir irrelevant to people who actually study you know, uh, biology animals in, in the field, you know, in the real thing. Although I do hope that at some point all these worlds will, will come together. And certainly for my part, I'm totally, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the attraction of anybody in biology is the amazing stories that we just heard uh, in the previous talks about these incredible animals and what they do is just, I don't know, it's just dreamlike uh, material. When you can turn this into science, then it's, it's even better. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. So what do I do now? I, I unshare, stop sharing. Well, whatever, whatever is worth, I think the biologists are very interested in the whole question of time and clock synchronization in cells and so forth. I mean, and whether they communicate in order to synchronize different cells to, to, to synchronize their clocks.
I mean, I don't think they know a lot about it, but I think that's a it's fascinating question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Anybody else have questions at the end of the long day? I think there's some in the Q and A, maybe. Oh, okay. Let me take a look. Q and A. Uh, although the times seem to be confused because it's different time zones. I think there's one question here for two from Frederick. Why does correlation go to minus Yeah, one? yes. It's because they end up going in circles. So they form circles. So the, the long-term, I mean, the really long uh, range correlations are are kind of meaningless. They really should not be uh, uh, should not be counted because these birds always they don't go straight be because they have to stay over. You know, eventually they roost on in, in a few trees, so they just go in circles like merry-go-round. Yeah. So I don't think that's why we don't even bother about these long-range correlations. Yeah. Um, So are these questions for me or for somebody else? Or oh, I think the time zones co complicated the questions. So, so the questions from the past, that look like they're after your talk. Yeah. Uh, anybody from the panel wants to say a last word? Uh, maybe I, I have a question, probably completely unrelated, but uh, is there any link to percolation theory? Yeah, oh yes. In, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the entire theory of criticality in the IC model is almost isomorphic to percolation. I mean, not entirely, but it's extremely similar. Yes. I mean, certainly philosophically, it's exactly the same phenomenon. Yes. Um, I shouldn't say exactly the same phenomenon because, uh, but, but the, the critical probabilities, all of this corresponds to the critical temperature. So, yes. Uh, but again, I think that the, um, from my Point of view, the um, my major um, not criticism because that's not the, the right word, but but to me the main limitations of this entire theories or living system is the assumption of equilibrium. That, that these are theories that, that are inherently based on equilibrium. Now I know you can extend them sli slightly outside of equilibrium. Yeah, I know, but that's not philosophically. They are not. They, they're not designed for that. They are designed for equilibrium, and life is almost the definition of not. Be, being in equilibrium. You, you have constant production of entropy through the absorption of free energy into work. And, and that's just the very basis of life. So I think when you take very short range uh, snapshots uh, over small time windows, then the assumption of equilibrium, I think makes sense. Yes. And you can, because there you can easily factor out the non-equilibrium -equil part as some modes of your, system that but otherwise you just cannot so so i think these are the limits of the statistical mechanics approach i think it was great first day <laughs> yeah, well, i really loved you thank you so much for inviting me again and for all the uh and i'm much looking forward to the talks tomorrow yeah me too and michael you're gonna be on the first thing in the morning <laughs> It's going to be first thing in the evening, but yes. That's true. That's true. You have a whole day ahead of you. So I think. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thanks again, and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.